All right, all right, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, it appears that we are live. Once again, I repeat, we are officially live over here on Global Media Inc., and it's going down tonight. That's right. On the 1st of July, Shabbat is upon us. We've got an exclusive interview and response video from the good brother, Mikael Edwards, also known as Mr. Controversial. You know Mikael is one of the co-founders and original members of the Hebrew War Machine. You know him from Blog Talk Radio. We are also promoting his latest YouTube channel. As many of y'all are probably familiar with, when you're bringing out this truth, when you're, when you're exposing some of the things in the fraudulent activities that you witness, you're going to have haters. They're going to flag your channel. They're going to report you to YouTube. So Mikael's last channel rapidly approached 1,500 subscribers in a very short amount of time. And unfortunately, it was flagged and taken down. So I want to share uh, the promotional flyer with the audience because part of the reason we're here tonight is to bring uh, some attention to Mikael's latest channel. So what you see now is the official flyer for tonight's presentation. And that's the good brother Mikael Edwards. You can find him on Facebook forward slash Mikael Edwards. And his YouTube channel. All you have to do is type in Mikael, Mr. Controversial, Edwards, RBG Hebrew. Uh, this flyer will also be the thumbnail. Feel free to reach out to Mikael on Facebook and YouTube. So, to make a long story short, uh, there's been some recent debates, discussions, and topics that have uh, drawn a lot of controversy, a lot of opinions. Um, and, you know, Mikael is going to address that tonight. He's going to come with some scriptures. He's going to give you his perspective from the Torah. He's going to touch on some of the ancient and biblical times. So, uh, I also want to let the family know we are joined by Yahawada, also known as Kevin, and the good brother Yaakov, also known as James. So, I'm going to briefly, very shortly, introduce them one by one, let them tell you a little bit about themselves, and then uh, we're going to turn it over to Mikael so he can begin his presentation. So, Yaakov, if you would, unmute your mic, introduce yourself to the panel. Uh, tell them a little bit about yourself, good brother. Shalom, shalom. How's everybody doing on this great marvelous day? First, I want to give honor to the creator of the universe, my God, who has given me salvation through his son, Jesus Christ, also known as Yeshua or Yahweh Shai. But uh, I'm, a, I'm a Hebrew Israelite who's been in the truth for about two years. But once I got in it, like I say all the time, I dug in deep and just went as far as I could go with it. I, I'm, I'm getting new wisdom every day through prayer and research. And um, I'm just here today to support the brother in what he's doing because he's going to bring a view and allow us to assist him to bring out a view that we all hold so it can be very clear what our position is because I think we're terribly being misrepresented. But that's about it. All right. Thank you, Yako. Uh, definitely appreciate you participating in tonight's uh, interview, tonight's response video. It's going to be a great group dialogue and discussion. Also, Yahawada and Yaakov will be reading for Mikael Edwards and helping him bring out some scripture. Yahawada, if you would, unmute your mic, please, good brother. Introduce yourself. Tell the audience a little bit about you, and uh, we'll move on with uh, tonight's presentation. Hey, peace, peace, everybody. What's going on? My name is Kevin G., uh, also by the name Yahawada bin Yasharala. Um, basically, um, as James has already put it uh, nicely, um, there's a lot of stuff being put out there um, about the whole thing of being an Israelite. Uh, and personally, I consider myself to be an Israelite by faith. Um, but there seems to be this uh, view uh, about one West camps. And uh, what a lot of people are doing is that they, they kind of spread this view out to everyone else, basically um, putting them in the umbrella. Um, 
And, I, and that to me, I think is not right, uh, simply because there are a lot of good people, loving people who like to teach people, reach people, um, believe in salvation for all, yet they don't subscribe to all of the things that they like to put out there in mainstream in regards to the group. Um, so when it comes to certain doctrines and things of that nature, and if they're attacking that, fine. Um, but when you lump people together and you attack the group and you try to make accusations, and then you kind of find yourself in this mix. So um, I'm here basically to support Mikael Edwards to clear out one of these uh, things, and uh, I will assist in reading as well as uh, bringing out some things as well that will help uh, get a clearer picture to everybody out there in uh, YouTube land. Peace. All right. Thank you, Yahweh. Appreciate your position, uh, participation tonight. Uh, you know, your views and opinion are definitely respected, and I uh, appreciate you and Yaakov reading scripture for Mikael as well. All right. So we we'll go to the myth, the legend, uh, one of my favorite teachers. I love his teaching style. It's unique. Uh, it is all his own. And he uh, has a way of taking every event and occasion and turning it into a teaching moment. So uh, I'm glad he finally made it over here. Tonight is definitely dedicated to Mikael Edwards, and he is our honor tonight on this platform. So uh, Mikael, unmute your mic, introduce yourself, give us your opening statement, and whenever you're ready to begin, take it away. The, the mic is all yours. Right. Well, hallelujah, Yahuwah Eloheinu. I praise the God of the ages for this day and this opportunity, a day to further establish right teaching, a day to further establish truth, and a day to further let the world know who we are, Hebrew Israelites, who we proclaim to be, and again, who we are, even from the scriptures. I thank God for this day, and I thank God for these brothers that's on the panel that I brought with me because um, just as the Shema says, Deuteronomy 6 and 4, that Yahuwah is one, our God is one, and we are still one in God. And there is no I's or U's in God, but it is one spirit. And that spirit I wanted to bring my brothers in because we are of the same spirit. And although maybe we have different names and different perspective us, uh, 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 views still prime motivation is spirit order restoration repentance salvation and resurrection and so today I want to start off speaking directly to James White much of the presentation that I'm going to give is um, more of a teaching for our people because I think our people have been stripped of a lot of things We've been stripped of nationality. We've been stripped of identity. We've been stripped of pride. And most painfully, we've been stripped of the tears that we can shed over our plight. You see, the world has compassion for the Jew man. They cry. They have holidays. They put all of the gas chamber issues out and the Hitler and all of these things. But our story, our story in America has been made into Bojangles, has been made into entertainment. But our story is of living people that endured pain, stripping of the nationality, their language, their ways, their mores, everything that every nationality around this world holds dear today. And so the fact that I'm going to speak to Mr. White directly today comes out of that feeling that our plight as as you would say African Americans or black people but we relate the nation of Israel in North America we feel pain frustration yes but we feel that that pain and frustration has been mischaracterized one more time that pain and frustration has been mis characterized and even villainized and demonized. Now Mr. White has made several assertions and mischaracterizations, mischaracterizations, excuse me, 
and generalizations about who we are. Mr. White has said on the open, wide open internet that we are vile. <laughs> we are violent. He says that we abuse the Bible. He also says that um, people like GMS, and I know that sometimes vocab Malone can be a little bit fair, speaking about GMS and making a difference between them. But when you speak of a nation of people, you must be specific, you must be exclusive and inclusive when you speak. Because all of the world doesn't know the difference between GMS and the real Israelites. Now, when we speak what is considered violence, well, let's wonder why the Bible speaks these very things. And I want one of the brothers to read for me Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. Either brother that, that's, that's here, whoever can grab it quick. I'll grab Revelation. it real quick. Yes, sir. Yeah. Revelation. I got it. I got it. Revelation chapter 13, verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth yes. with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. One more time, brother. Read that. All right. Revelations 13 and 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. Now, ah, here is the patience and faith of the saints. <laughs> A violent statement, as Mr. James would take it. But Mr. James, from all of our mouths, us reading and relishing in this, a comfort, the patience of the saints. What we've been here suffering, Mr. James, when we speak this, this is not a violent uh, aggressing of you. This is something that the scriptures declare, and this is a universal truth. What goes up must come down. What goes up must come down. If you enslaved my people, it is only right that one day, maybe not through my hands, maybe not through your hands, but one day for that to be balanced out so that you can understand, number one, the pain of my people. Why we are considered violent or maybe even vile at the outset. We have been led into captivity, taken into captivity, and without going through the whole uh, all of the history of lynchings and slavery and our raping as a people by almost every nation of this earth. Without doing all of that, simply saying identifying with Revelation 13 is no sin. Mr. James does not want to hear us speak about Revelation 13.10. Why? I suggest because it sends a chill down his spine, a sobering message that God is a God of justice and order. And God repays. Oh, yes, God repays. The scripture says that God visits the iniquities of the father upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those that hate him. Now, that suggests that God lives long to make sure Revelation 13 and 10 comes about. There is no sin in us preaching that, Mr. White. James thinks that we are wrong to speak frankly about these things, these things that are not spoken about in Sunday churches. You see, I am very much still a part of church worship, also Sabbath keeping. And so I'm, I'm by trade, I'm a musician. And so when I go to churches all over this country, all over this country, I don't hear Frank speaking, let your yea be yea, nay be nay. I don't hear, let the scripture speak, and we conform to that. But I hear a concerted, unified message in the Christian churches of let's shrink the word of God to fit our liking. 
But the word of God is not made to be shrink. We have to gain weight to fit the word. And I suggest if you can't bear the word, Mr. James, in all of his fullness, in all of his frankness and his realness, then you need to go back and grab onto the horns of the altar and repent and ask God to renew your heart, give you a heart of flesh so that you can feel the pain of our people in some respect. Now, Matthew chapter 15 speaks about what I started speaking about when me and Mr. White spoke on the phone. Can you brothers uh, open up again? Matthew 15, 25. All right, I got that. Matthew 15 and 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not, is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, but the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus, then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, this is a beautiful depiction of the mercy of God through his Messiah. Even it is a beautiful picture of the frankness and the stern nature of this Jesus, not Joe Osteen, but this Jesus in the scriptures. He says, again, read that first portion of it again, my brother. Sorry, my, my uh, mic was uh, muted. Uh, then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. She came and worshipped, saying, Lord, help me. And this is a woman crying out for mercy, no doubt. Scripture says he ignores her. He answers her not. But she continues, continues persisting, persisting in her submission to this Messiah. Now, it is definitely made plain here that he is classifying her as a Gentile or, more frankly, a dog. Now, when we look at uh, the scripture's conveyance of this dog, <laughs> in the Greek that word is equivalent to the, a puppy, right? A baby dog. But he says here, Matthew 15, uh, let's get it. Excuse me one second here. All right. It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And this is a very emphatic statement. But Christ is asserting a premise here. That premise, again, is what he started off saying. I was sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That statement cannot be changed. That statement cannot be changed. One more time, that statement cannot be changed. Now, these lost children or lost house of Israel, lost sheep, are likened to children in this verse 26. These children is not an analogy or a, 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 a time for you to make your way in this. The children that he's speaking of, salvation, healing, and the promise, the children are the children of Israel. Let's make no doubt about it. He's not speaking about little babies, little Greek, white, Roman babies. He's not talking about anything except what he alluded to in verse 24. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, Again, reasserting that he speaks to this woman and calls her a puppy dog, a dog. She says, persistence and humility, Mr. White, understand. She said, yes, master, for even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. How many Gentiles around the world have that disposition of submitting even when called a puppy dog by the Messiah. 
I would suggest to you that James White and many of the other uh, scholars, considered scholars, Mr. Mike Brown, would be offended at this statement. Yes, they say that they worship Jesus Christ. They say that they love Jesus Christ. They adhere to the word. They submit to it. But all of the word has to be submitted to. This scripture, one more time before we move on, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This woman submits herself as a dog, eating crumbs from the master table. And here, verse 28. Let's read it for us, for us, brother. Verse 28. Verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thy will. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Hallelujah. Now, this asserts that persistence, genuineness, and submission is the way of the Gentile. Persistence, genuineness, and submission is the way of the Gentile to receive healing, salvation, resurrection, all of the things that are embodied in the scriptures promises to Israel. See, Mr. James, there is no Israelite camp that is worth their salt that would ever tell you that this woman or you although considered maybe dogs, that you can't get a crumb, that you can't be fed, that you can't receive salvation. The scripture says there is a place for you. There is a place for you. But let's go and find that place. Let's find that place. And we will go to Zechariah chapter 8. Let's read 8 and verse 23. All right, let me get it right now. Zechariah 8, what verse? 23. Uh, eight. Yes, 8 23. I'm already there, Yahweh. All right, go yeah. ahead. Zechariah 8 and 23. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages and, and the nations, even shall take hold of the shirt of him that is a Jew saying, we will go with you, for we heard that God is with you. Hallelujah. And this is prophecy. This is prophecy. And again, this is the way of the Gentile. There is order. There is a way. And this scripture says, again, in those days, ten men from all ALL languages of the nations shall take hold. Yes, 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 it reasserts. They shall take hold of the edge of the garment of a man, a Yahudi. Ha, ah, makes it specific. He does not say that the Greeks are going to be joining in with the Romans and the Romans joining in with the Australians and Australians and the uh, Deutsch people are going to have just a good potpourri party. No, 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 no. Scripture says that there is order from the beginning, even in the Tanakh, that your process of salvation in this prophecy is to take hold of the very people Christ says in Matthew chapter 15 that he himself was sent to. Let's reassert that again. Christ is sent to the lost sheep, the house of Israel. Nothing else. He doesn't say anything else, but also... Here, mercy for this woman, mercy for the world, mercy for the nations that can submit like this woman or that can submit like those of Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. Can you grab hold of my garment, Mr. James? Can you submit yourself as a world-renowned scholar? Can you submit yourself to those God has given a promise? Well, let's speak about being grafted. Romans chapter 11, verse 11 through 31. And before we read that, before we read that, we can understand simply, simply, simply 
that again, God is a God filled with mercy. And so goes his image, his son. The purpose for him coming is mercy. But here, a greater mercy in Romans 11. L let's read it, brother. All right. Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, Stop. if the fall of them. Yeah. Stop. This says that the fall of us or these that have the promise was to provoke us. The giving of this mercy to the Gentiles was to provoke the seed, the branch, the root, the, the tree. Let's go on. Let's go on. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles in as much as the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify thy office. Continue, brother. If by any means I may provoke them to emulation, them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Keep going. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches are broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, wert grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, so that I may be grafted in. Very well. Because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spare not the natural branches, take heed lest also he spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity, but towards thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou shalt be cut off. Now, this is a total mercy of God, but a total aspect of God's wisdom <laughs> and it's many reflections in the way that we treat each other we like to make each other jealous so that we can get a desired effect and so goes this but again the mercy that you James can be grafted in you can be given a seat in the kingdom but this says for you not to do what you are doing, boasting, bragging, telling the world that the root, the branches are rotten. And you're even telling them that we are not even here. Wow. You accept Michael Brown. Michael Brown is a castaway Jew-ish man. But we are rejected. We are rejected for reading that very scripture. This scripture that suggests that, yes, we were cursed even, broke a law, fell away, and was that the promise through faith given to others. But all not for you, Mr. James, to say that it's wrong for us to tell the truth. We speak every day about the curses, about the fact that we are in America, who being who we are, because we failed. We broke the curses. We looked at other things instead of looking at God. There lies a mercy for you. There lies a place for you. But just in the layman's term, when we fall away, you're grafted in, you boast against those that were of the natural seed. Now, let's go to Galatians chapter 3. This is a little out of order from the way I got my notes here, but I think I, I, think I need to do this one first. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Galatians chapter 3, 
verse 16. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He, he let's said, let's stop right there. Let's okay. stop right there. To Abraham and his seed. That word seed equivalent in the Hebrew would be Zera. Okay? I know this is Galatians. But we're talking about seed. And this promise has a precept that lies in the loins of Abraham. The nation and the culmination of the nation in the man Christ Jesus. Zera, seed. Now, when I point out to you, Mr. White, that Christ says he was sent for a reason, sent to a people, and you say to me, you reject that. You reject the idea that this promise was not given to seeds, plural, but to, again, seeds. Let's hear Paul read it. Let's, let's hear him speak it. Go ahead, brother, with the rest of it. All right. Galatians 3, 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seed as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. One more time. Once more. Galatians 3, 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seed as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. All right. Now let's go to Genesis 12, 7. And let's grab a precept because Mr. Vocal Malone acts as if we're Baptists. We're not Baptist Vocal. We know how to use the scripture. All right. Genesis 12 and 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And Stop. there build it. Stop. Again, we have again that very specific word, Zera, singular, seed, having to do with sperm. Flesh production. All right, let's go on. Unto thy seed I will give this land. And there build it he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And removed oh. from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. Having That's Bethel good. on the west. That's good. I wanted to just simply reassert from verse 16. I'll let you go on a little bit too long. <laughs> verse 16 again. But, to, but the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say and to Seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Mashiach. Now, why is it so wrong, Mr. White, in 2016, for us to point out what the writer of Galatians and the writer of Genesis says so frankly? You don't want to identify with ethnicity, and you said to me on the line that you reject the idea that any assertion or insertion of ethnicity into this, the promise, you reject. It's abhorrent to you. But seed has to do with genetic, has to do with walking, living progenitors, descendants. And even here, a culmination. And watch this. 1 John 4, 2. Let's hear what it says about those that don't receive flesh. 1 John 4 and 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Great. Now. We have another, again, a reference to the flesh. And there is no getting around it, James. I know you, you like to do that. You like to say, well, no, that's not it. Well, let's read that one more time. Let's head, let Mr. James hear it again. Because I know you know it, Mr. James. You know it in Greek. Let's hit him again with it. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come of the flesh is of God. Wow. So, if you don't want to speak about it, Mr. James, 
What does that make you? What position does that put you? Anti-Mashiach. That puts you anti-truth. Jesus Christ came in flesh, in the flesh, not just for you to identify what color, but to identify him as a man, but again, specifically, his color, his identity, his nationality even saved his life. The word of the angel telling his mother and father to take him away from the war zone. They're trying to kill the baby. Take him to Egypt. Why? Well, I would suggest to you, Mr. James, that nobody runs in a room of white folk after I've been out gangbanging and I'm running, you know, I run into a building off the street. I wouldn't do that. So again, going to his people, being raised amongst people like him, is important to assert. But we have in the Christian church that I said that I deal with very closely, we don't hear this. We don't hear this. And most of the world, and this is very simple, but this is crazy. Most of the world does not equate Egypt with Africa, with black people. And this is a shame. This is what uh, uh, brainwashing and what all people, not just us, but all people have been robbed of. Truth, simple truths even. Christ grew up in Egypt, in North Africa. How? Why? Because he was black-skinned, Mr. James. There is no sin in pointing that out and telling our people that so that they can have a semblance of self-respect and identification with the image of God, in which we all are, but that which conveys the very spirit of God so that we can be whole. Christ's flesh was important. Now let's read. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's, let's switch gears and let's have a little bit of fun. I spoke to Mr. White about Diana of Ephesus or Artemis. Okay. Now those two names are a clear red flag to something. Wait, wait, why is she known as Diana? Why is she known maybe as Artemis? Well, let's talk about it. Brother Basim, could you please put up on the screen this perceived pagan, de pagan deity of Ephesus. Let's put up the actual uh, photo and we're going to show you that even this deity, and we're going to show you why, Mr. White, because this information is not me being racist. I'm telling you this for a reason. Diana of Ephesus was depicted in her early inception as a black deity, a black deity. One more time, a black deity, black face, black hands, black feet. Again, this is a place that Paul went to to preach. Let's dispel the notion that Paul was in Greece when he was in Ephesus. Okay, first, let's, let's instead of the Diana, can you please put up the map that I Right. I'm going to start with the map, Mikael. I've also got the religious text you sent me, and I am searching for the images because they never got sent. But we have the map, we have the religious text, uh, and I will continue to pull up some images uh, as you continue to go in. You're definitely teaching, good brother. The people are enjoying it. Take it away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, this Diana of Ephesus, and as you all just saw the map, Western Turkey is where Ephesus is. One more time, Western Turkey. Turkey. Turkey, not Rome, not Greece, but Turkey. Although the, the area of Ephesus was at one time ruled by the Romans, ruled by the Greeks, we talking about Turkey, not Greece, not Rome. Again, I asserted to Mr. White that not only Diana was considered a black deity, but let's, let's, let's talk about what he didn't want me to let speak about. <laughs> the perception of the people living in Ephesus about deity. 
what they should be depicted as. And this was very important, not maybe to Mr. White because he's afraid of race, he's afraid of ethnicity. But again, the Library of Alexandria met its fate because a white ruler was a little bit upset about the depictions and perceptions of gods, how they look, how they are to be depicted and venerated. Now, Diana, or earlier, previously to being called Diana, was called Artemis. And there is a temple to this deity in Ephesus. Diana is supposedly the daughter of Zeus, the twin sister of Apollo. Right? One more time, let's say this again. These are all Greek deities, main high Greek deities. Artemis is called Diana. Early in her inception, Artemis, Temple of Artemis. Later, Diana. Daughter of Zeus, twin sister of Apollo. Now, why am I saying that? Because I can picture Mr. White's face looking at, shaking his head, saying, what is, what, why, 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 why? It's not any purpose of me bringing that up to try to reinstill that Diana was a god. I said she was a perceived pagan deity of the time. But the perception of the people was that this thing had ethnicity. They put it on the statue. But Diana herself later was whitewashed. And if you can Google Diana of Ephesus, and this picture, I don't, I'm not sure if uh, Brother Basim can pull it up right now, but if you can go in Google, everybody listen, type in Diana of Ephesus. You will see late Roman images, and you know what the Romans do to even zoo-type deities in Kemet. They freak it out, and they refuse to let it be as it was in its inception. Romans don't worship anything but Romans. Greeks don't worship anything but Greeks. And guess what? Whoever wins the war gets to tell the story. But the perception of the people of Ephesus, if Diana was depicted and venerated as a black god, and she has a family structure, okay, so-called family structure, we know we're not talking about real flesh gods people, but we're talking about the veneration. Just wrap your mind around it, Mr. White. Would Zeus be white? Would Apollo be white? No. If we're talking about some people that venerated color, color, one more time, color, and it is important because just as I pointed out to you, with all of the other images of Diana, the later images were whitewashed whitewashed. Now I want to give you a, a article. Uh, this one is The Black Greeks, Professor Clyde Winters. Okay? And let me give me one second to pull it up so I can show you this. Just a small section in here. All right. Okay, coming up right now. Give me one second. All right. Now, again, you can look this up. You can look it up and source it out with the, the website Rasta Livewire. <laughs> the Black Greeks, Professor Clyde Winters. In this article, J.A. Rogers in Sex and Race, Parker, Diop, at Sheikh Anti Diop, Du Bois, on the other hand, are Afrocentric scholars. I'm starting at like the second paragraph here, so if you guys are trying to follow me, you can you know where I'm reading from. These scholars have reviewed the writings of the classical authors, the anthropological, linguistic, and historical evidence to reach the conclusion that the ancient Greeks were black. One more time, that the ancient Greeks were black. And that the European Greeks learned from the liberal arts and sciences from their black ancestors who first settled Greece. All right? And it says, and the Egyptians. Well, we're specifically honing in on Greek. 
According to the Olympian creation myth, the earliest groups to appear on the earth were the Libico Thracians. Okay. The Libyans were proto Saharans, this article says, as were the original Thracians. Some Thracians were descendants of the Cushite and Egyptian troops established at Trace by Sestastros. Okay. When he conquered Asia and Europe, Diop, uh, Sheikh Diop, 1991, and Professor Winters, 1983. Now, many of the so called Greek myths are in reality historical texts which show the ancient, listen close, the ancient lifestyle of the pre Aryans in Greece. Let's start that again. Many of the so called Greek myths are in reality historical texts which show the ancient lifestyle of the pre-Aryans in Greece and the transition from Pelagian, Pelagian matriarchy to a Greek Aryan patriarchy. Okay? The term Amazon was often used by the Aryans to denote matriarchal societies living on the Black Sea. The battle between Thessus and the Amazons led by Queen Melanope records the conflicts between the ancient Aryan Greeks and the Libyans settled around the Black Sea. Now, in a day like today, where we have people that, number one, don't look at maps, people that like to make generalities, and a generation that has whitewashed everything and lives true to that credo. Whoever wins the wars get to tell the story. What we're looking at in these whitewashed images of Diana is these Roman people later, not the original Greeks, not the original inhabitants of Ephesus, and not really those people that migrated into that place. But we're talking about what Diana turned into taking my time to talk about a pagan deity because, again, it makes a really strong point. Those later whitewashing images come because of the Romans occupying and ruling this area. And just like in the life of Alexandria, uh, excuse me, Alexander, <laughs> you can still call him Alexandria because he was a faggot, excuse me. But just like in his life, here in the Romans and their acceptance of Diana or not, they want to worship something that looks like them. One more time, they want to worship something that looks like them and even refuse to worship that which was prime. Here is what was wrong with Alexander. All of those black deity statues around Egypt. Here's what was wrong with even Mr. James White. <laughs> The scripture says Christ came in the flesh. He was even, well, we don't want to put him on the level with Diana, but a black deity. We're talking about flesh because it's important. It's important to the knowledge of a people. Now, again, Diana depicted as black, but later whitewashed as a white woman because <laughs> there were white folk living there. And again, when you have a black deity in these areas, even North Africa, the Levant, and into this area of Turkey, when there are black deities, there are a predominant number of black people. But when the deities change, they become looking like Mr. White, then you can understand that there is an amalgamation. There are different migrations coming into that area. And so, again, I asserted to Mr. White that Paul's point for going into Ephesus was not necessarily looking for white folk to save, but going there for the same purpose that Christ was sent and then dealing with the in grafting those that are of true Gentile genetics. And let's define just a little bit of what Gentile should be considered as. A Gentile 
does not necessarily have to always be a white man. A Gentile can be an Israelite that has gone off and start uh, following James White. Ah, let's call names. Laron G. Consciousness. Oh, wow. Instead of James grabbing onto your shirt, you have grabbed a hold of his. Why? Because James does not respect the frankness of the scriptures, the frankness of history, and the things that come from history. Again, whoever wins the war tells the story. Now, let's talk about Niger. We all know this scripture in Acts. I think it's Acts 8 1. Is that? Check me on my right, brothers. I'm, I'm calling this one off the fly. The word Niger in the book of Acts. Is that chapter 8? Uh, yeah, yeah. Hold on. Let me, let me actually get that right now. Okay. Uh, no, that's chapter 13. Okay, okay yes. I, I'll read it for you real quick. Uh, that's Acts right. Acts 13 and 1. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas, and Simeon, that was called Niger. And mm. Luke, oh, well, that, that's about it on that part. All right. Now let's run and jump to Acts 21, verse 38. And let me remind you again, Niger is still a place that is not inhabited by Macedonians, James. You telling this world and telling me and everybody else that ethnicity has no place in scripture is an abuse. I started off saying you tell us that we abuse the scriptures, but that is exactly your falling, your downfall. You abuse the scriptures because you don't want to accept the scriptures. On our conversation, I asked you, I know you teach the Bible, but do you believe it? One more time. I know you teach the Bible worldwide, but do you believe it when it speaks about Niger in Acts 13, where it speaks about, let's read Acts 21. All right. So Acts 21 and 38 reads, um, Art not thou that Egyptian? which before these days made us an uproar and led us out of the, to the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers. Beautiful. And again, here, another time again, where these notable men, even the prophets, and this Paul, who, uh, 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 let's, let's, poll, let's poll the panel. Kevin, who is being called an Egyptian here? Uh, that will be Shaul. Thank you. Oh. Now, that's very easy to read, right? We can read that and we can understand. This, this, this is what is being implied here. Am I right, brother? Very simple. Yeah. Um, hey, also, hey. If I might add, um, there was also a uh, passage in the Bible um, in which uh, there was the death of uh, Joseph. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, they, when he died... The uh, Israelites went out there and actually was doing the ritual of burying his body and whatnot. Um, but the, the onlookers were saying, look how the Egyptians mourn. Beautiful. Um, so it was also, they were looked at as these type of people. Um, and it also with that same storyline going back years earlier, uh, when they visited the brother, they didn't know that he was their brother or an Israelite. They looked at him as an Egyptian official. And, and of course, if we look at the history on that, we, we clearly know what that's all about. And that is a beautiful addition to this. A beautiful addition to this. And I want you to one more time, man, because I, I, I tell you, our black people learn through repetition. They don't learn through us running this information through their brain. Hit it one more time, Kevin. Say that one more time about the funeral. One more time. Yes. Yeah, so when Joseph died, um, they were burying him. The Israelites were burying him. And when they were burying him, the onlookers, the people of Canaan, were saying, look how the Egyptians mourn. Uh, so they didn't call them Israelites. They didn't look at them as a Shemitic people. They look at them as Hamitic people. Um, and this is just as clear as day. So they were they were identified as that. So that's something we have to deal with. And we can't say it doesn't matter because we also have to answer the question. Well, why is it in the scriptures? 
That's right. And that is Genesis chapter 50. And I speak about this as a further commonality. This, uh, this truth in this, this passage even speaks to our brothers that we're dealing with, that uh, with the Kemet and the Hebrew tension. Hey, once you're living in a place over 300, 400 years, you're that. You're that in your nationality at that time. You may have subculture, you may have spiritual identification, but you're that. And the perception of these people that were looking on to Jacob's funeral, they called all of the people, the Egyptian mourners, the Israelites, or, or, or excuse me, Jacob's sons, they called them all one thing. James, that means something. And like the brother said, it's in there for a reason. Again, we just made plain the whitewashing of Diana. And we've moved on to making these assertions that flesh is important. And again, let's go 1 John 4, 1, 4 and 2, speaking of Christ, his flesh. We already mentioned uh, Galatians, Zera, speaking of seed, having to do with your sperm, even sperma, which is a Greek word. We can't get away from genealogy. We can't get away from genetics, nor race, nor skin color, because it helps you identify. Let's read one more time. I think that we read it already. Let's read it again if we did. Uh, yeah, First John 4, 2. two yeah. Uh, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Beautiful. Now, Mr. White, will you confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? I know you believe that he came, but in the flesh, that word is in there for a reason. Do you believe in that man, Jesus, that one that hid in Egypt? That one that even called you a dog, but said still, 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 you can have healing, you can have salvation, but it comes in an order. The scripture says, to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. Now, let's talk again about whitewashing images, because James, I'm going to stay there because you got to hear this. And our people have to learn what collusion does. Let's read the definition of collusion for Mr. James. Do you have that definition, Brother Basim? Yeah, I have it actually here. Uh, okay, yeah, no, read. Go ahead and read it. Go ahead and read it, Kevin, but I'll screen share it. But of collusion. course, I have it ready for the good brother. A noun, meaning the end or finish of an event or process. And it also means a judgment or decision reached by reasoning. Okay. What, what definition are you reading that from? Can you grab Miriam Webster's de definition? I, I got you. I got you right now. Collusion. Now, first definition. A secret agreement. Mm. By yes, let's, oh. let's hold right there. Let's hold right there. <laughs> a secret agreement. And I simply said the other day that the synagogue of Satan is compartmentalized. What I mean by that is that the synagogue of Satan is not just the Jew bug, the guy with skin cancer that's saying that he's indigenous to Israel and that land, but nature is killing him. Listen to me. The synagogue of Satan is complex and compartmentalized. Let's finish reading this definition of collusion. Okay, I, I, I'm going to give you a little bit different one. I think it's even better for you right now. This okay. is from the uh, Oxford Dictionary. Secret Good. or illegal cooperation or conspiracy, especially in order to cheat or deceive others. Mm. Now, who has had collusion on their back like a monkey, like a heroin addict got that monkey on his back and he can't even walk around without getting his fix. 
Who has had that monkey of collusion on their back? Well, overly, I will tell you, since the book of Maccabees, which you hate, Mr. James, you hate the Apocrypha, you hate it, you hate it, you hate it. But there's a reason why you hate it. Because it tells about y'all's disposition. Those that seek salvation but cannot humble to the order, the purpose of even the being, the, the sending of the Messiah, being sent to the lost sheep, and then that salvation being to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, we have nations that have had secret agreements. Watch this. Collusion even encompasses this, a secret agreement to play enemies. <laughs> One more time. A secret agreement to play enemies. Well, Mike Brown, James White. One more time. A secret agreement to play enemies. Mike Brown is... Uh, supposedly Jewish, right? Disowned by his people pretty much, but again, Jewish. Now, James White holds Mike Brown close, comfy, but collusion can be an agreement to disagree. And I'm not saying these two disagree, but the nations of these two overly and predominantly disagree. They disagree on what should be the word, what trans, what what manuscript should be the word, what should be accepted, how salvation is given. But listen, one has a stolen identity, and one is trying to only tell the story because they won the war. Well, the white Jew. As relates to collusion, he has stolen nationality. One more time, let it ring in the air, has stolen nationality. And let me give you a secret about nationality that most white people over here won't speak about. You know why they won't go home like they tell most Negroes when they get really upset? Nigga, go home. Well, white people are not indigenous to here, but do they have a home? No, not anymore. Not anymore. So they fight tooth and nail for this land because they cannot leave. They cannot go back home. They cannot have a nationality in their indigenous geographic positions. So... Here we have a reason for collusion. Well, let us, let's read Maccabees 1, Maccabees 3, 4, 8. Maccabees chapter 3. Uh, yes, 3, 4, 8, 48. Maccabees 3 and 48 reads, The Gentiles would have consulted their idols in such a situation, but the Israelites unrolled the book of the law to search God's guidance. Continue. They brought the priest's robes, the offerings of the first grain, and the tithes, and then they brought in some Nazarites who had completed their vows. The whole community prayed, Lord, what shall we do of these things? Where shall we take them? Now that your holy temple has been trampled and profaned by Gentiles and your priests mourn in disgrace, the Gentiles have come to attack and destroy us. You know what they plan to do. If you don't help us, how can we stand up against them? Is that First Maccabees chapter 3 verse 48? Yes, sir. Uh, First Maccabees chapter 3 verse 48. Mine says, and they opened the book of the law. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they opened the book of the law to inquire in those matters which the Gentiles consulted the, consulted the likeness of their gods. Did you read that part? 
Yeah, basically, I think I'm reading a different translation. Um, okay. The one that you have, because it worded the same way. Now, I have my okay. KJV here. Yeah, let's read it out of the KJV because it even gives a better direct. Uh, All right. uh, well, Maccabees 3 and 48. And they laid open the book of the law, wherein the heathen has sought to paint the likeness of their images. Let's they stop right there. Oh, wow. Let's stop right there. I never read this. Yes, let's read it one more time for Mr. James White. And they laid open the book of the law, wherein the heathen has sought to paint the likeness of their images. Mm. Wow. Now, let that ring in the air, Mr. White. When we speak to you about Diana, when we speak to you about Caesar Borgia, when we speak to you about the flesh of Christ, and you say, that doesn't mean anything, and ethnicity injected into the scripture is abhorrent to me. Well, why were there people that wanted to change the image the likeness of even the gods that were as related to the books of the law. And they opened the book of the law to inquire into those matters about which the Gentiles, the Gentiles, consulted or sought to paint the likenesses of their gods. Or another version says, uh, consulted the likeness of their gods. Again, their gods, Mr. White. Why does every nationality have to have their own damn God, Mr. White? Ah, well, for the same reason that Protestantism has spawned over 30,000 denominations. Because everybody got to have it their way. But the Bible is written for a reason. So that everybody don't have their way. And in the Bible that you hate, the 1611 King James Bible, it opens with to be read in churches, to be read in churches, to be read in churches, so that everybody don't get to have their way, Mr. White. You don't get to say that, oh, we can't read Maccabees. Put that out. Let's not read Matthew 25. Let's not read that Barnabas was called a nigger in the ancient days. Let's not read that Paul was confused with an Egyptian. Let's not read that Christ went to Egypt to save his life as a child. Wow. And none of this is being taught to our people from the church. We do it on the streets. And you say it's an abuse. But how can it be an abuse when it's in the scriptures? Now, why don't you validate the Apocrypha, Mr. White, as inspired? And we're coming up in 40 minutes, so I'm going to speed a little bit of this presentation up because I, I, I want to just get some input from my brothers here. But you said that the Apocrypha is not inspired. Well... Why? Let's, let's, let's explore some of the reasons and misconceptions that people like you say that the Apocrypha <laughs> is null and void and not inspired, but yet, but yet, but yet seek the New Testament Apocrypha from Bishop Archbishop Wake. You see, you talk about Magnesians, Trillions, Paul and Thecla and all of the other foolishness. That only, really, well, the majority of white bishops of the church validated. But, 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 you say the Apocrypha is null and void, not inspired, shouldn't be used. Well, let's look at why. Mr. James says that mm, it's not inspired maybe because witchcraft. Because these are common things that I've heard from Protestant Christians that the book of the Apocrypha, the Apocryphal books promote witchcraft. Let's read Tobit 6 and 4. 
let's see, what, because when they give you an opportunity to read it, you see, they did what was terrible. They snatched it out of your Bible, so they don't want you to read it. Not, no, no, not, not, you know, unless you get the knowledge of where it was and where to find it. But it was snatched out, and I'm saying they, not James and your family, but you know what we're talking about relates to con collusion. The apocrypha in the 1611 Bible should be there. It is not there because assertions of your kind, Mr. White. Witchcraft. Let's read Tobit 6 and 4, please. Let's get into verse right now. And when we read this, I want you all to plainly see that there is a difference between a person's perception and a person telling you stay away from that than the real truth. You ready? I can grab it. My apologies. My apologies on that. No, uh, good, I didn't know good, I'm, I'm, I'm right yeah, here. Yeah, I'm yeah. right here on it. Tobit 6 and 4. I'm right here on it. And we'll read it. But the angel said to the young man, catch hold of the fish. Listen, James. Let me start again. Catch hold of the fish and hang on. But the young man, uh, excuse me, so the young man grasped the fish and drew it up on the land. Then the angel said to him, cut open the fish and take out its gall, heart, and liver. Why? To worship the devil? To do a sacrifice with? No. It says, as, uh, excuse me, and liver are useful as medicine. And is that not right? So why is it called witchcraft? <laughs> Mr. White, you're crazy. Let's see, the book of Enoch is shot down by you because that is a part of the apocryphal canon. The book of Enoch, misconception, common misconception. Angels are named, and that's wrong. Wow. Why is that wrong to name angels? When there are a man, I think, in the Old Testament, his name is even Uriel. Well, let's look it up, so because I got it. Mr. White may say I'm lying. Uriel, let's find him. All right here. All right. First Chronicles six. First Chronicles six. Can we read that, brother? Six and twenty-four. Just start there. And this is a, a genealogy. Okay, what we're reading here in First Chronicles six and twenty-four. But we're gonna see a definite name of an angel. And angels are even named in the scriptures in the canon books. But we hear many people, don't call angel names. What is 1 Chronicles 6, 24? 1 Chronicles 6, 24. Tahath, his son, Uriel, his son. Right Uzziah. there, just stop right there. All right. Well, here we have men named after angels within our Bible. Why shouldn't the angels have names if the Messiah has a name, if God it's himself even has a name? That's ridiculous, Mr. White, for you to tell us, don't read the book of Enoch. Don't read the book of Tobit. Because there's medicine in there from fish guts. Because Uriel is named and other angels, they're in the Bible. How about communicating with angels, Mr. White? Well, 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 well. Is it wrong? You would say yes. But I'm telling you, Paul said he communicated with angels. And we're going to prove it. 
Now, let's go to the book of Enoch first, and we're going to use this uh, kind of like precept, all right? We're going to use the book of Enoch as a base precept to Paul, all right? Enoch, 83 and 1, and um, woo, here's a very large, <laughs> a large book I have. I'm going to give you the reference. Uh, R. H. Charles D. Litt, D. D. Okay, fellow of Merton College, fellow of the British Academy, Oxford, Clarendon Press. All right, this is the Ethiopic text, but it also has the Greek portions and fragments in this. It's a complete, exhaustive edition. Enoch or Enoch one. Now, without me going through this big old huge book and reading all of that, I'm going to let you all reference it. Eighty three one Enoch. He speaks in heaven, Mr. White. He speaks to the Holy One and the angels. All through the book of Enoch, Enoch is conversing with angels. But y'all say it's wrong, Mr. White. But let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. Now I believe that's the first verse in 1 Corinthians 13. Let's read 1 Corinthians 13. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels. Stop. Read that again, brother. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels. Well, go ahead and finish it out. Let's, let's finish it out. And have not charity, I am becoming as sounding brass. Or now. Or Tekin, go ahead. Go ahead and finish it up. I'm sorry. Symbol. Now, our Christian, you know, propagation of this verse talks about charity. But I'm lifting something that is there, Mr. White. Though I speak with the tongues of what and of what, brother? What did he say? Of men and of angels. So, Ah, communication with angels, speaking the tongue of angels, is that heresy now? Is it wrong? Is it wrong for us to know the names of the messengers of God? Is it wrong for us to know how to make medicine, James? No. No. One more time. Mikael, if I... Mikael, if I could real quick, to, to make, yeah, to make a long story short, uh, he's basically saying that, you know, you don't have a right or you shouldn't follow that because of omega-3s, fish oil, which a, lot of, which a lot of people take to this day as a supplement, okay? And that's all it really is. Please continue, good brother. Whoa, one more time, Basim. One more time. Hit that again. Uh, basically, all that's referring to is omega threes, fish oils, which every a lot of people take uh, as a supplement. You know, it can be used for various things, but it, it you know it can deal with uh, cholesterol, weight loss, blood pressure, things like that. It's uh, a omega three fatty acids from well, fish. Well, not only that is um, there's actually an article on WebMD on how to make your eyes whiter and brighter. And it says that omega-3 is one of the best things, or if not the best thing to do for the whiteness of the eyes. And what we just read, I was shocked because it actually says, uh, for this can cure a man of the whiteness of the eyes. Hmm. Now. Now. <laughs> James, you want us to stay away from that. You want us to stay away from the history of the Greco-Roman. You want us to stay away from the abomination of desolation? You want us to stay away from knowing who Alexander was and his dastardliness and Antiochus and the rest? You don't want us to understand who Judas Maccabeus was and the Maccabean family and the revolt and all of the things that take study and unraveling, but at the same time build a man. Why? Why? One more time, why? 
let's just give you some quick references and then we're going to move on to a very short section and then we're going to move along. Uh, Enoch 9 speaks about the souls of the dead crying out. Now, is it wrong for us to know that the souls of the dead are crying out? Or anything about the realm of the dead, Mr. White? Because the book of Tobit is about death. Tobit was basically an undertaker. <laughs> but the souls of the dead crying out in the book of Enoch is congruent with Revelation 6, 9 through 10. Same thing. <laughs> The term king of kings, lord of lords, even god of gods, Enoch chapter 9 again. We'll find that term in 1 Timothy 6, 15. And I hope all are writing these things down. Revelation 17, 14. Revelation 19, 16. The tree of life even referred in the book of Enoch chapter 24. Spoken about in the book of Revelation. Mr. White, you're tripping. Why do you want to take everything from black people that will empower us? That will give us a higher understanding in a better way. When you want to use, let's talk about it. Just quickly. The epistle of Ignatius. To the Ephesians. And I'm staying on Ephesus because this is the point of attraction. I told you that Paul was in Ephesus preaching secondarily to Gentiles of your condition, but firstly, lost Israelites considered Gentiles in a Gentile mind state. Now, the epistle of Ignatius. The ones that I am privy to are translated by Archbishop Wake. Now, Basim, if, if, if you'd like to read that, if it's clear for you to read it, if you could read it, you, you could go ahead and read it, or I could read it from here. I'm going to oh, pull oh. it up. I'm going to pull it up for you, oh. since you have a, a better pronunciation. We've also been joined by the good brother, Priest Anyala, Chief Priest of the Lions of Israel. Uh, Shalom, Priest Anyala. Hallelujah. Uh, Yes, appreciate you joining. Uh, definitely want to get some commentary uh, as soon as Mikael finishes up from uh, Priest Don Yala. Mikael, uh, tell me how good you see that. I zoomed it in as well as I could. You should be able to read it, good brother. Let's see. I can't see it yet. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay. All right. Now, here we have... Uh, book, uh, or the epistle of Ignatius to the Ephesians. Now, I call this the apocryphal New Testament, all right? <laughs> but James White loves this stuff. This isn't in your Bible that he's telling you that it's wrong to read the apocrypha, but he has his own kind of apocrypha that he'll bring out. Talking about magnesiums to the brother the other day. That brother probably hadn't even heard of magnesiums. But you do. And you're slick. But not that slick. The epistles of Ignatius are translated by Archbishop Wake from the text of Vossius. This is, I could be uh, um, wrong. I'm not going to make that assertion, but I'm just stick with the paper here. Translated by Archbishop Wake from the text of Vossius. He says that there were considerable differences in the additions. The best for a long time extant containing fabrications. Let me read that again because I stumbled. The best for a long time extant containing fabrications. And the genuine being altered and corrupted. One more time just to understand what that is. The extant containing fabrications and the genuine being corrupted and altered. Archbishop Usher printed old Latin translations of them at Oxford in 1644. 
at Amsterdam two years afterwards. Vasius printed six of them in their ancient and pure Greek, and the seventh greatly amended from the ancient Latin version, greatly amended, was printed at Paris by Reinhardt or Reinhardt, 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 excuse me, Reinhardt, in 1689 in the Acts and the Martyrdom of Ignatius from a Greek uninterpolated copy. Now stay with me. These are supposed to form the collection that Polycarp made of the epistles of Ignatius, mentioned by Irenaeus, Origen, Eusebius, Jerome, Athanasius, Theodoret, and other ancients. But many learned men have imagined all of them to be apocryphal. And I'm, I'm telling you, Mr. White, these are your people. This supposition, the piety of Archbishop Wake and his persuasion of their utility to the faith of the church will not permit him to entertain. Wow. Hence, he has taken great pains to render the present translation acceptable. He don't even want to hear the truth. He, you know, okay. To render the present translation acceptable by adding, by adding, one more time, by adding numerous readings and references to the canonical books. Now, this is one of your main secondary sources, Ignatius. His writings, and we just showed you, trans, uh, weirdo, uh, Conchanterbury, Bishop, Wake, translated them in a bubble, refusing to even understand that they were corrupted, even the originals corrupted. But do you speak about that? No, you don't speak about it. Why do you not speak about it? Because you're just like the people from Maccabees 1 that sought to spate their images because they want to identify with a white Diana, with a white scripture, with a white text, with a text that rubs and scratches their back. So, Mr. White, why don't we ever hear this story about the fallacy and the messed up copies of the Greek uninterpolated versions of Ignatius's writings from you? We hear about the Apocrypha. I encourage all of you all to get these books that I'm about to uh, read, and you can get it in one book, so you can see what Mr. James loves and what he hates from us. I call it again the Apocryphal New Testament. You can find it in the Bell Edition, 1979, a cheap book. It contains the Book of Mary, the Protovangelion, the Infancy 1 and 2, Christ and Abarus. One of these things about the emphasis says Christ was speaking as a baby. I said Christ was talking as a little bitty baby. Now, you're using this crap, but you want to throw away medicine, omega-3? Come on, man. Christ and Abarus, oh, excuse me, Abagoras, Nicodemus, the Apostles' Creed, which there are three of them, that I don't hear nobody in church talk about, why there are more than one Apostles' Creed, Mr. White? You don't talk about it. You stress the Apostles' Creed, but you don't talk about there are three and all are different. Those that disagreed that Christ went to hell. <laughs> the Laodiceans, Paul and Thecla, Paul and Seneca, Clement. Barnabas, Ephesians, here's Mr. White's favorite ones, Barnabas, Ephesians, Magnesians, Trallians, Romans, another Romans, one more time, another Romans, Philadelphians, Smyrnians, Polycarp, Philadelphians, Hermes' visions, Hermes' commands, Hermes' similitudes, the letter of Herod and Pilate, and the lost gospel according to Peter. Now, this is what Mr. White got tucked in his back pocket as his New Testament Apocrypha. But when you read through this trash, you'll see why it was considered a fallacy even from the original texts. But our original texts, as relates to the Apocrypha, speak about world history. Not just saying that 
um, yes, Archbishop Wake wrote it so we could understand that since he liked it, we'll like it. Stop it, James. You're with that foolishness. And that's another reason why the word of God needs to be channeled through those of the covenant. Because even in this book that I just suggested to the people, you'll see whitewashed images even in here. All of these pale-faced white people in this book, and they did it here, just like in the book of Maccabees. Now, with that, I got a deeper presentation, but this is like I've been on hour, and I don't want to get, you know, fish and company stink after three days. So <laughs> I want to let my brothers knock a dog on home run. So right now, I want to bring in Kevin. I want to bring in. Uh, James, I want to bring in Brother Ron, if you're still there. I want to bring in Brother Daniela and let these brothers speak to Mr. White and speak to these people. Well, uh, I appreciate what you're doing, man, but uh, this is one thing that I've always stood on and something I've always said. I am not a person who says that I am race-centered, but here's the thing. Um, I, as I read the Bible, as I read history, we cannot ignore the things that are mentioned about race, race and ethnicity, and we cannot ignore a lot of the things that are done by different organizations and peoples and clans that try to override the history of another people. And that's something that we just cannot say, oh, it doesn't exist, let's, let's, let's do away with it. Sure, the average believer can say, well, all I believe is in Christ and his salvation, and that's all I need to focus on. That's good. But if we are believers in Christ, then I think that is an, it is a necessity to unveil all everything that is considered truth, uh, not just to put it away to say, well, it doesn't matter. Well, wait a minute. Christ, as he said, the, uh, the uh, example to Nicodemus, after he explained to him about being born again, he actually explained to Nicodemus one simple thing. He said, this is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world. And all those things that are hidden in darkness will be revealed. So if Christ is coming into the scene and we're reading the Bible, you're doing the history, and you find out these things in, 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 about different clans and people and how they are trying to overwrite images. Why is it that the, the, the Pope uh, at the time, Caesar Bogier, why did he uh, change these things? The, um, uh, 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 Constantine and um, not just Constantine, but also Pope Gregory is 15, uh, I think it's the 1500s or the 16th century. Uh, of 16th yeah, century, century uh, uh, AD, why was it that they changed the date in the times of the first of the year? Why did they change it from Pesach or Passover, which originally was in the, in the spring, to something that is already in, Jan in January? Why did they seek to change the times and the, the feast days and things like that? And why were they doing this? Um, sure, you are assured in Christ and you are saved in Christ, but we have to we have to answer these questions and we have to discover these mysteries as to why the establishment is doing this. Why do they do this constantly? Um, it's even getting to the point, and not even black people, but just uh, uh, even white people or people of other races, they even say, you know what? Every time they come out with a Bible movie, it's, 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 it's always whitewashed. Or the, the last, there was the last two movies about Egypt. It was the Kings of Egypt. And what was the other one? Exodus, Gods and Kings. It was like uh, the, the pharaohs was looking like Christian Baal. <laughs> and it's like, come on. We, it's a time where we need to just reveal the truth, show it, and is it beneficial to the people? In my opinion, I, I say with uh, all uppercase Y-E-S, yes, it is, because you got to think about it. If a people is under a society, which they're looked at as the lowest, they're 14 percent of the population in the United States. So they're not really looked at as much as anything. They're, they're considered a minority. When people see them on news or on TV, they say either they rap or they play sports. Um, I think it will be beneficial to those people not only to see uh, Barack Obama in office or not only to see uh, somebody of their race do something influential in the community, such as Martin Luther King, George Washington Carver, uh, Benjamin Barack, all those types of people, but also to see people in the Bible being portrayed in their skin color, which is the truth, them looked at as people that were in Egypt for 400 years, that they did intermarry with a lot of Africans, uh, that they basically looked like us and had the cultures from where we came from. And I think that people understood that which I think, a lot, I'm sorry to be long-winded, but a lot of Israelites, if you want to know the truth, uh, part of the reason why I feel like a lot of them are gravitating to the Bible even more because they see themselves in it, especially when you say that they're an Israelite. 
And a lot of them, we cannot say, oh, it's a racial doctrine, sure. There are some that say that or do that or practice that. But at the same time, you have to consider a lot of people who came up out of the darkness they were in. They were drug dealers. They were gang bangers. They were out there on the streets not knowing what to do. And they seen people saying, look, you are in the scriptures. Jesus doesn't look like, what's that singer? That dude, uh, I forget his name, but, you know, everybody look like Jesus. It's some dude from the 70s, a hippie or whatever. He doesn't look like that. He actually, potentially, according to the history, looks something like you. And it, it take, maybe it takes Iggy a spark Pop. to see that. You're talking about Iggy Pop. No, no, I was, I, it came up in my head. I'm talking about Kenny Loggins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, really quick, I wanted to uh, really quick. I want to share that picture just so nobody doubts anything that Mikael brought out. I was trying to download it and screen share, and a bunch of things happened. Uh, here's the picture, really quick, and then I want uh, Yaakov and Yahweh to pick up right where we left off. But Mikael, there's the image, good brother. If you wanted to comment briefly. Yes, and just briefly, just briefly, if you all look at that that image there, that image is again an idol but it speaks to the mental of the people the perception of what deity should be should be venerated as and even even our deity that the bible says that you must accept he has come in the flesh well, the people of the ancient world and all people should understand that prime, prime, prime should be the image of God. Prime. Go, go, brother. I, I'm <laughs> but hold on, I have another. I actually have a testimony. Um, somebody asked me. I, I somebody asked me the question: Do I believe Jesus is black? And a lot of people say black Hebrew is like this, Israel's is like that. They try to make Jesus black and they have this whole doctrine, this, that, and the other. Here's something significant that people, a lot of people ignored. That's something I noticed actually twice. Um, but somebody asked me the question, do I believe Yeshua HaMashiach was a colored man and where he was black? And I said, well, being from where the people came from, who they mixed and amalgamated with, where they spent uh, 400 years and where they came down the line and how they were portrayed, if you look at historical records such as uh, Tacitus, uh, he actually said that some believe that the Jews were actually a sect of Ethiopians or they came from Ethiopia. Um, so when you have all this together, I say, yeah, with that being said, I do believe that he was a man of color or black. And somebody actually said to me in the chat room, this was like a, a couple years ago, they said, if I ever find out Jesus was black, I'm going to stop being a Christian. And there was a lot of people who said that throughout my life that, like, I say, yeah, he might have been color or black. And people was like, I don't believe that. It's my, it was one person who actually had a funny look in their face, like, really? Like, they were disgusted. Like, that's not true. And it was one point I was in an all-Christian chat room. And this is a true story. I said, yeah, I believe Jesus is black. Every single one of them changed their avatar to the white Jesus. And I was like, okay. And I felt the hate. When I mentioned that there's a black Jesus, they did not like it. They hate it. So I, I see what people are saying about black Hebrew Israelites and this, that, and the other, and the racial doctrine. But, dude, a lot of people ignore the fact that people will actually reject Christ if they find out he was black. Now, that's a bigger problem. Dang. Dang. I mean, those, those are powerful words. And the first thing I want to say is I concur with everything that these brothers have said so far, man. I mean, we have to be able to speak truth to power, you know, and um, this ever since this whole, you know, Christian Hebrew Israelite thing kicked off and they've had the little Facebook groups and stuff, you know, I've had to get on not only these Christians for the type of behavior they're showing while they're sitting there talking about they're a Christian, but I've also had to get on some of my brothers for getting so easily offended by it. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just going to um, read John. 16 1 through 3 and it says these things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended they shall put you out of synagogues or churches today you know like James White would kick you up out of his church if you came in there trying to talk about ethnicity race and who the Israelites are and it said yea the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that they do it doeth God service because all of these Christians that are coming against us right now 
truly think that they're doing God a service by doing this. You know, and these things will they do because they have not known the Father nor me. Now these are Christ's words. So all these people who are coming out here speaking against us, trying to jump down our necks, how about you look at the information? How about you take the time and see where we're coming from? See if there's any truth to what we're saying. Check out our doctrine. Don't criticize it before you've ever even looked at it. You know, but that's what goes on. And it's hard to get away from that. And it's hard for a lot of people to see beyond, like y'all saying, race. Like Kevin said, people would stop being Christian if they found out Jesus was black. Why? Because they know why Jesus came. It ain't that they don't know. They know he came for his people. He came to redeem his people. They just want to be considered his people so they don't have to see that wrath he coming with. And that's just the truth of the matter. But it was also some other things that I wanted to add on to the conversation. I got a couple verses that I want to bring out here and speak to. Uh, John 15, starting in verse 1. John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband. Every branch in me that bear not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that bear fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. And so I want to bring that out just to let brothers know that keep doing your work, you know, because people are going to come up against you and look at you and try to tell you all types of things about what you're not, what you ain't going to be, but keep bearing that good fruit because God is sending people like James White and these other guys our way to help us raise to a new level. You remember how when Kemet came against us, how we all banded together, got our scholarship together and rose up to that level, and now we're about to close the door on Kimmy, close the sarcophagus. But now we got a new challenge coming on. Why? So we don't get lackadaisical, so we don't get lazy, so we keep our scholarship up to par, and we keep pushing forward. And um, it also goes into show about, you know, uh, the, the vine that they always talk about they graft it into, but I'll get a little bit more to that later. And then um, I'll start right here because we got to get history on this father being a husbandman and this vine. Because we know that everything about the nation of Israel points back to Yahshua. And let's go to Psalms 80 and 8 real quick. And it says, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. So this makes it very clear that this vine is the nation of Israel, which is ruled by our king, Yahshua. And then I'm going to go down to Isaiah 5 and 1, which says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And if anybody knows what this is talking about, it is talking about Jerusalem. It is talking about the nation of Israel being this beautiful vineyard of the Most High God. Then I'm going to go also to Jeremiah eleven sixteen. 16. The, the Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and goodly fruit. With the noise of a great tumult, he hath kindled fire upon it, and the branches of it are broken. Now I brought this out to talk about you know, the northern kingdom being broken off. I'm not here to say that no Gentiles can ever, you know, partake in this vine. But like the brothers have said before, pecking order. We have to keep this in mind. But it's also to show that this vineyard, again, is the nation of Israel. So let's go back to John, but we're going to go to 15, 3 through 6. Now, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. Now let's keep in mind that he is in Israel talking to Jews at this time. And back to verse 5. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. 
for without me ye can do nothing. If a man abideth not in me, which is the vine, he, he is cast forth as a branch, and it withered. And men gather them and cast them into fire, and they are burnt. And I want to say this one thing. The nation of Israel has been in the past cast into fire and has been burnt. But the Lord is gathering us back together, this nation that is undesired. And he is putting us forward to tackle these Goliaths in this world so we can tear it down from the roots. And then I'm going to close this out by going to uh, Romans 11. When we talk about these uh, these wild olive tree that is being grafted in. And I'm going to start in verse 17. I ain't going to read too much. 17 through 20. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Because remember, branches abide in the vine, not in themselves. Boast not against the branches. And we're talking about the natural branches here, the nation of Israel. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root bearest thee. You know, the natural branches feed off the roots, which bears anything that's grafted into it. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. And this is exactly what these people, they're saying that the, the nation don't matter. It don't matter who they are, what's going on with them today. I know that I'm grafted into this tree. And it goes on to say, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou shouldest by faith be not high-minded, but fear. And I'm just going to stop right there because I know everybody knows this. Because y'all, anyone who considers themselves to be grafted in to this nation needs to do it with fear. Knowing that they can easily be purged, cut loose, and thrown into the fire. And I'll just close it out there. I just wanted to throw some things out there so maybe it can cause a little dialogue between us and the brothers as we get ready to close out. Well, that's beautiful, man. I mean, that's right on the money. That scripture speaking about the grafting. We, we covered that. That's, that's two times for you, Mr. White. And you must submit to the word. You can't shrink this. You got to gain weight. I... I, I Psalms chapter 147, verse 19 and 20. Declaring his word to Yaakov, his laws, his right rulings to Israel, he has not done so with any nation, and they have not known his right rulings. Praise Yah. This speaks of that duality that I spoke to you before. I will fall, but it's still... Still, still, the charge was given to Yaqub, Yisrael. Why tear this out of the Torah? I mean the Tanakh. Why tear it out? Why try to act as if this is non-effect? Well, because you don't humble. Because you don't receive the word and the spirit of God. Neither the man Christ in the flesh. That is a sin. Mr. White, if you are abhorred by us telling you what is the prime, prime motive of this book, 